Hello there, this is Dr. Mintz. This is a patient who presented with abdominal pain and bloating. And we will do our routine, let's look through the whole abdomen before we commit to anything. So we go from top to bottom, and then back up through from the bottom to the top. Okay, the last thing we're gonna look at is bowel. Perhaps you've noticed that there is distension of bowel with oral contrast layering in portions of what seem to be relatively prominent bowel, but we'll hold off on that for the moment. And we'll go through our routine, which is liver, spleen, where's the spleen? Here's the spleen, liver, spleen and pancreas appear normal. Here's the pancreas. You kind of get a little hint of the pancreatic duct, a little tiny thin faint structure down the middle of the pancreatic body and tail. And the tail of the pancreas points as always to the splenic hilum. This is the splenic vein. The splenic vein joins the superior mesenteric vein to form the portal vein and the portal vein then courses superiorly and to the right toward the liver and that allows the portal venous return to flow into the liver and that's a venous process and subsequently the hepatic veins drain the venous blood from the liver into the inferior vena cava, which then goes to the right atrium. So that's liver, spleen, and pancreas. Let's see, the gallbladder looks fine. Let's see how the adrenal glands look. You have to think about them to see them because they're not going to jump out at you like a liver or spleen. Here's one Adrenal gland, it looks fine. The limbs of the adrenal gland look thin. Let's see if we can see the adrenal on the left. A little hard to determine here. You have the vessels from the splenic hilum contributing to some of this stuff. But I see a thin structure which looks like it probably is at least one of the limbs of the adrenal gland and then it kind of bunches up here so I think we have two limbs of the adrenal gland this one here and then one going over here that's just obscured by the adjacent tissue but the fact is I don't see any mass in that area so the fact that the adrenal gland is hard to see and there's relatively little fat in that area the perirenal space uh, it's not too surprising that it's hard to identify the limbs on this side. On the right side, we see them more clearly. On here, it looks a little bit more gathered up, but no definite mass. So the adrenal glands, and let's see how the kidneys look. They look pretty good, no masses, fairly symmetric renal enhancement, and that's an important finding of or lack of a finding because when there's an obstruction, there's delayed nephrogram on the side of obstruction. And so you will find that the degree of enhancement of a kidney is less on the side of an obstruction. And so you will see an asymmetry in the renal cortical enhancement pattern, which we do not see here. Always wanna look at the lung bases and here we have some small areas of opacity in the lung bases that, let's see if I can window it up here, look mostly linear in their configuration. It doesn't look like a mass. It doesn't look like a frank consolidation with an area of lung completely opacified. So you have these little stringy, linear, flat structures in the lung bases and they look like atelectasis. And it's not uncommon to have atelectasis, which is the same as volume loss. 
in the dependent aspect of the lung, and in this case, when you're lying on your back, the dependent aspect is the more posterior aspect. Okay, so the lung bases have some mild plate atelectasis. Here's the IVC. And let's see if we start from the top of the aorta. Here's the abdominal aorta. First you have the celiac artery coming off, after which you have the superior mesenteric artery, the SMA, and that course is right under this vein, the splenic vein that we addressed just a moment ago. Here's the abdominal aorta. It appears to be normal in caliber. Okay, so we haven't seen anything yet really worth noting. But what we do have are dilated segments of colon. In fact, most of the colon appears dilated. And I'm going to take you right to, let's see, a KUB first. And here you have what looks like colon. And this is not the normal, normal course of the colon. This is a tortuous colon that is distended and abnormally dilated. And I don't see any air past this point, except maybe a little bit of air here. It could be small bowel. But fairly moderate to severe air distension of colon from the right colon through the transverse colon to here, which may be the splenic flexure, or it could be a portion of the probably splenic flexure, given what we're seeing here. This is just hanging down kind of far, like a portion of the transverse colon. And then very little air that we can clearly see in the colon distal to this point. So this is suspicious for an obstruction. So our job now is to go and look and see what we have that we can find of, uh, of an obstruction. And if we look at the axial images again carefully, we see that already we know that this is colon. This dilated bowel is colon here. And so let's see, we follow this down. We know from that scout view that it, it loops way down low before it courses off to the left. And let's see here. Okay, so it comes up, it loops down like this, and here's a low point. Then it courses back up this way. And here, let's see if that's correct. Yeah, this part here crosses over and then it goes up like this, and then this is splenic flexure, and then it courses backward, and then it heads down, and right about where it heads down, right in the proximal descending colon, we have this wall thickening. We see this circumferential soft tissue thickening in the upper portion of the left colon, and we see it here down a little bit lower. We see it here too, and then it gets very tight and continues off this way as the sigmoid colon. So there is an annular constricting mass lesion circumferentially involving the left colon. How do I know this is left colon? It's not because it looks like the le left colon. It's because of its anatomic relationships. And we have traced those by following what we know is a transverse colon, partly based on our interpretation of the localizing image, which is a KUB-like image. And we follow that up here, where it joins as a splenic flexure here. And then we follow that down, and we immediately encounter this area of, no of narrowing. So once again, it's not that it just looks like the left colon. It's that its anatomic relationships are those of the left colon. Its location and its anatomic relationship to the colon proximal to it, as well as its overall position in the abdomen, all indicate that this is the left colon. And what we see of that left colon is that there's circumferential soft tissue narrowing the lumen for a segment of length here. And we might be able to see that better 
on the coronal images, and the coronal images show you how dilated the colon is and how it's tortuous and, and distended up until this point where it reaches the descending colon. And in that area somewhere, we have soft tissue. And here, let's see if I can window that a little bit more nicely for that. There we go. So this is the distal transverse colon or proximal splenic flexure. And then we encounter this area, this segment here, where there is peripheral soft tissue attenuation narrowing the lumen of that segment of colon. And right here, particularly, you can see how narrow it's getting. And of course, with the fluctuation in the diameter of the colon with breathing and abdominal mu movement and uh, with uh, just general movement of, of the body and changes in the configuration of the relationship of the distal transverse colon to the left colon, you'll see variations in the amount of obstruction that you might get. But here we can tell that there is a substantial obstruction largely based on this dilated colon proximal to it. So what we have then is an annular constricting lesion involving a length of probably four or five, probably five centimeters or so of the left colon with obvious associated obstruction with dilatation of the right colon and transverse colon consistent with colon carcinoma. So we've done our job, right? Not quite. You have to look at the bones. And let's take a look at those bones. And we'll go back to the axial images for that. Find a bone window. And let's look carefully at the bones. Always important to look at the bones. You don't want to be surprised and find something after the fact. Look here. What we have here is a vertebral body we have the posterior elements here on the right, which look normal, and on the left, they're destroyed. This is where the pedicle would be. This is the pedicle on the right side that's intact. The pedicle on the left side is enlarged and destroyed. This is the lamina on the right. This is the lamina on the left. That is destroyed and largely replaced with soft tissue. Uh, this is a spinous process, which looks fine. The transverse process here laterally looks intact, but we don't really see it on this side. So this mass has involved most of the posterior elements of the, this vertebral body on the left. And you see a nice contrast between the normal unaffected side here and this destroyed left segment of the vertebral of the uh, vertebra. So this is a very conclusive, really, uh, finding to indicate the presence of metastatic disease to that vertebra. And let's see which one that one is. So here's 12. Here's 12. And then we get into 1. So this is 1. And this is 2. So this is L2. OK, so that's L2. So a destructive process involving the posterior elements of L2 on the left. Let's see if we look down a little bit further. Here's, here we're coming into L3. This is L2 here. Go down a little bit lower. Here's L3. Here you see something else. For some reason, metastases, they say they like to go to the pedicles. They show up there very clearly, and for some reason, there does seem to be some predilection of metastatic disease when it goes to the vertebra to go to the pedicles. And this is an example where we see it on the pedicle on the left at L3. And probably, now that we know that that's going on, I pro probably wouldn't call this by itself, but now that we see the neighborhood, if you will, that this is living in, this looks like a suspicious lesion for a metastatic lesion there as well at L3. And let's see, we'll look at L4. Uh, this could be a degenerative Schmorl's node, but I'm suspicious given the neighborhood again that this is 
a metastatic disease, we can look at that in the coronal plane for confirmation, perhaps. Then we look through all the bones here. This little lucent lesion right here doesn't look right. It doesn't belong there. That's probably a small lesion to the right iliac bone. This is a little suspicious, although it has a sclerotic margin, which I wouldn't expect a metastasis, or these metastases do not show uh, elsewhere, but I think that that's still suspicious for metastatic disease. And we have something out here that looks suspicious as well, a lucent lesion in the left iliac bone. And as is often the case with bony metastases, the more you look, the more you find. Here's something that looks like a metastasis, a small lucent lesion in that inferior portion of the iliac bone. These are a little bit more difficult because they're in the joint space, so they could be joint space related, but still it's possible that those are metastatic lesions. Okay, and let's look at the bone windows on the coronal images. And here we see L2. Here's L2, here's L3, we see a lesion here in L3, we see one here in L4, here's the one in, here's one in the sacrum, S, S1 you could say, at two positions. So this is a patient then with an annular constricting lesion of the descending colon involving several centimeters of length, producing colonic obstruction, which is incomplete because we can see that there is some oral contrast getting through to the bowel distal to the level of obstruction. And there are no met metastatic lesions because we looked through, the, there's no metastatic lesions to the liver. We did evaluate that initially. And there are numerous osseous metastases noted. And that's it for this case.